at any given instant, the number one piston in an engine, for example, may be pushing up to compress an air fuel mixture. At exactly the same time, the number four is going up as well, but she's going up because her exhaust valve is open and she's pushing out the spent air fuel mix. While those two are doing that, at the exact same moment, the number two is on its way down because it's just been a firing event and she's being pushed. The number three is also on its way down, but it's actually pulling. The intake valve is open and we're drawing in a fresh air fuel mix for our next firing. Now, these four pistons are connected to the four journals and they offer four different stresses all at the same instant. Now, this wouldn't be so impressive if it weren't for the fact that all four journals are part of one piece of your engine, the crankshaft. The varying and differing stresses on this can be enormous. Now, to appreciate your crankshaft even more, imagine that you're in a rowboat and you're rowing. You reach out, you drop your oars in the water, and you draw back, and we do that. When you draw back, okay, as you do, the boat is propelled through the water. Your oars, while pushing the water back, push the boat forward or ahead at the same instant. Then when you come all the way back, what you do is you lift your oars out of the water to repeat the cycle. When you lift your oars out of the water, the push ceases. The boat is coasting. The boat slows moment by moment between push strokes. So we have a cycle going. We push and we coast. We push and we coast. We push and coast. If you had a sensitive speedometer on your rowboat, you would see that the speed would pick up a bit during the push period and it would slow a bit during the coasting period. Now what I want you to do is hold on to that push and coast rhythm for just a moment while we look at something else. If you own a late model car, one of the features of your more modern car is that it has the ability to, dis to, uh, to detect a misfire. That's right. Your modern car's computer can watch your engine spinning at a few thousand revolutions per minute and know if a single cylinder misses a single firing event. How does it do that? Well, while the crankshaft is going around, there's a sensor. It went into the crank, and she's watching this, this crankshaft going around. Each time a cylinder fires, the crank gets a push. Remember the rowboat? And for an instant, the crankshaft actually rotates at a slightly higher speed. Then a moment later, the push is gone. The crankshaft slows and begins to coast, waiting for the next cylinder to fire. Your car's computer watching through the sensor knows when each push should occur, and it's watching for each brief acceleration. If that moment of faster speed doesn't come, the only answer is that a specific cylinder that was due to fire didn't fire. So your computer not only knows that a firing event didn't take place, it also knows which cylinder didn't fire. So put this all together. Okay, we have a crankshaft in our engine turning perhaps thousands of revolutions per minute with four different stresses happening at any given instant and all changing all the time. At the same time, while this is turning, the RPMs actually go up a teeny bit and go down a teeny bit, a slight rate up and down each time there's a firing and a coasting. And then she has to take and push all this energy out the back to get it to the transmission to get it to this car to move. While all of that's going on, if you're driving down the road and you take your foot off the gas for a moment to decelerate, well, those four pistons are all doing what they were doing before in a slightly different fashion, but the torque on this crankshaft is turned the other way around. With all these forces working on your crankshaft, that crankshaft has to be made to specifications that are far more demanding than the environment the crankshaft lives in. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Moss's 451-485 crankshaft for the MGTB, the MGTC, the MGTD, and the MGTF. Now, this technician is a simple guy. So when I went to, the, to see this new crankshaft on the, on the website, mossmotors.com, I noticed that it cites features like solid steel billet, EN40B, CNC machined, balanced, nitrided, uh, chromium, molybdenum, and 61-65RC. What does all that mean? Well, let's see if we can learn. The term billet to many people today means aluminum. However, that's wrong. The word actually means something else. A billet is actually a product of forming or shaping metal after it's been created in a mold or a casting. It can be rolled under great stress to change its shape and its density. It can be cut to form. Essentially, it's a piece of metal that's been formed into a shape that can be worked with. Any metal 
can be formed into a billet. In this case, the billet was made of steel. Now we read EN40B. This term actually includes some of the other terms. Raw iron was being cast by the Chinese some 500 years before the time of Christ. As the centuries went by, people determined that by adding little bits of specific elements to iron, it became better. EN40B is more than just iron. They add chromium from the periodic table of elements. They add molybdenum, also an element. They add silicon and carbon, two more elements. And this gives us the product, which we call EN40B. It's a very strong steel. Now the webpage also says that it's nitrated. The advantage of EN40B is that it readily accepts nitriding. Nitriding is when nitrogen is diffused into the surface, just the surface of a metal. This makes the metal march harder on its outer surface. It makes it tough. That's perfect for giving the metal a hardness where it needs to be hard, and yet it does not make the part brittle. If you think for a moment of an icicle, it's very hard, but if you bend it even a little, it breaks. Now think at the same time of a high quality chef's knife, okay? The edge of that is hardened and he can cut with that edge and keep working and it holds its edge just fine. And he can pick up that same knife and you can actually bend it somewhat either way and it doesn't snap, it doesn't break because it's not brittle. It's hard where it needs to be, but not brittle. Now, if we're talking about the hardness of metals, this is where we get to that part where it said 61-65RC. Okay, 61-65RC is, well, let me explain it. This technician has seen professionals who have taken a hacksaw blade and they will drag it across a piece of steel to determine if it's been hardened or not. That has a limited value, but it's not quantitative. It might tell if the steel has been hardened, but it cannot tell with any accuracy how hard it is. It can't tell if a hardened steel crankshaft is as hard as the engineering team called for it to be. Not hard enough can be soft and subject to wear. Too hard can be brittle and subject to breakage. 61-65RC tells us the steel measures within that range according to the Rockwell Hardness Scale. That's what the RC stands for. Rockwell Hardness is an international way to accurately measure the hardness of metals. It's a great indicator of reliability when the steel in this part is internationally recognized as being exactly what it should be between 61 and 65 on the Rockwell hardness scale. Now, we heard the term CNC machine. That's not like M&M, &M, the little candies with this enamel stand in the middle. CNC is three letters, the letter C, the letter N, the letter C. It stands for Computer Numerical Control. And this is when parts are machined by a set of tools that are computer controlled. If you've ever gotten a chance to see a CNC machine at work, you know it's amazing. The work is exact. So what they do is they take this billet of steel, they put it inside the machine and lock it down, and then just like in a lathe, a motor starts spinning the billet. The computer comes to life and starts using the various tools that are within the machine to turn the spinning billet into a crankshaft. After it's been CNC machined, the crankshaft is nitrided, and after that we have the 451-485 crankshaft. It's tough and yet it does its job beautifully. We learned that it's also balanced and we all know anything that's going to have to spin at a high rate of speed has to be balanced in order to operate smoothly. This has that. And something extra which the web page doesn't talk about. If you take a piece of metal and you cut it, do a nice clean cut, you're going to get a nice straight 90 degree angle just like that. And it's something to be proud of. They look good. But if you were to look at a 90 degree angle under a microscope, right on the very, very edge, you would find that there's a sharp corner right there. And where the corner is, there's a thin bit of metal. Now, if something drastic were to happen to this crankshaft or any piece of metal, when she's working, and if there's a little teeny bit of metal there, that's where you're liable to get a little bit of an imperfection, a little bit of a crack or a problem. And if you've ever seen what a crack can do to a windshield, you know what's going to happen. Once there's a crack, it can travel. The way to get around that is that instead of having 90 degree angles, what you want to do is you want to radius or make the current curved like that. This nice curved front is strong. It's very strong and it has no opportunity for something to crack. There's no weak points. So as you look at this crankshaft, when the CNC machine got through with the major parts of all the work, it went and it got a, a drill bit and started drilling these holes you see here for oil to get through. 
Okay, with those holes, well, if you've ever done it, if you drill a hole into something, you're going to get a 90 degree angle all around the edges of the hole. It's going to be like this. So when the CNC machine got through making the holes, it got another tool. And what it did was it rounded the edges of all these holes. So you don't have a hole with a straight corner like that anymore. You have a rounded edge going in there. There's no weakness. There's no point for something to go bad. So imagine you get your hands on this and you say, this is beautiful. It's a great looking new part. I'm dying to put it into my car. And if you had the idea of putting it straight into your car, that would be unwise. Let me explain. This crankshaft has seven journals. There's one, two, three main journals and one, two, three, four journals that are going to connect to the connecting rods and the pistons. These need oil. Well, we all know how oil gets around inside the motor. There's a pump at the bottom of the motor. She gathers up the oil and sends it up in a pressurized fashion through galleries throughout the block. So where this one, this one, and this one, the mains are all connected. They're bolted right up to the belly of the engine, right up to the belly of the block. And there's a oil gallery feeding each one of them. So these get pressurized oil. They're well lubricated. But you might say, but this isn't bolted to the block and this and this and this. These aren't, these aren't bolted to the block. How are they going to get lubrication? And to understand that, let's do this. I'm going to bring the number one up to where this hole is. I'm going to push a piece of plastic down inside it and watch what happens. Can you see that? It's coming out right here. There's a hole in this point right here where this bearing would sit in this journal. So you can imagine what's going to happen. Imagine this is in the car. Oil, pressurized oil comes in here, takes care of this bearing. And the pressurized oil is going to run up this hole and come out right here. And it's going to feed this journal. This one's taken care of. In the middle for the number two journal, piece of plastic again, she gets lubricated from there. And over here, piece of plastic again, and she gets it there. And the number four gets fed the same way the number one did from this journal over here. So these are all going to be in great shape. They're going to be lubricated. But imagine at some point between when this was actually made and then packaged and then shipped and then brought to you and then opened up and looked at, imagine if a little bit of grit found its way into one of these holes. You put it inside the car, you fire up the car, you have oil pressure here, the oil pressure runs up here and pushes the grid out right here. And the place in the whole world where you least want to see it, that's exactly where it winds up. So what we need to do is we have to understand that there is an important point to remember here, okay, that there is no such thing as a machining process that can guarantee absolute cleanliness. There's no machinist in the world who can tell you that a piece of grit has never gotten by him. The only person in the world who can have complete control over how clean a part is will be the last person to touch it before installing it. And that's probably going to be you. So the cardinal rule is simple. Never install a crankshaft before, without cleaning it. It always has to be cleaned before you install it. And that begs the question, well, how do you clean a crankshaft? And the, the answer might surprise you. You clean a crankshaft with dishwashing liquid. Not the stuff that we put in the machine under the counter, but that little bottle that sits on the corner of your sink. It's excellent for this. And someone might say, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just going to spray some solvents in here and here and here, and that'll flush it out. Well, Solvents are great for dissolving oil and grease. They really are, but they have no ability to hold particulates in suspension. And you might say, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, if we take our piston and just imagine for a moment that it's a little jar, and I'm going to put about a half a teaspoon of beach sand in there. I'm going to fill it maybe halfway with water, and let's put about a quarter of a teaspoon of dishwashing liquid in there and put the top on the jar. I shake it for a few moments, and when I do, what's inside? It looks like shaving cream, doesn't it? And if you were to look very closely at the shaving cream, you would see bits and pieces of the sand suspended in suspension in this froth that goes in there. If I were to rinse away the froth, the foam right now, I would rinse away the sand. So that's what we're trying to do. If there's a little bit of particulate in here and I run through with solvent, it may just go to a low point and sit there. So what I want to do is I want to get a bucket of soap and water, something that's going to hold it all together. I'm going to get this all lathered up as best I can. I'm going to get a little teeny brush and run through these holes. You've already seen how they go and make sure that they're clean. When they're clean and the outside is clean, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some fresh water and I'm going to rinse this entire part until it's nice and done. Okay. When it's all done, I'm going to put on a set of safety glasses. I'm going to get some compressed air. I'm going to blow out all these holes to make sure I've blown all the water out and anything that might have been dislodged. Blow off the rest of it so that it's dry. It's ready to go in the car. 
I'll put some assembly lube on each one of these points where the bearings are going to go. I'm going to put it in the car. I'm going to torque it up to the original factory torque specifications with new set of bearings in here, and she's going to be all set. So there you have it. Moss's 451-485 crankshaft is a 21st century masterpiece for your 20th century car. Buy it, clean it, install it. Then drive your car with confidence, knowing that the backbone of your engine is the best crankshaft available for your car today.